Well, congregation, I invite you to open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. Well, first of all, let me back up. Let us open our Bibles first to the book of Psalms, because it's my practice, you may remember from last time I was here, uh, that to read a little bit from each testament as bookends, if you will, or as one testament saying amen to what the other testament says. So Psalm 138 first. I have you turn there in order to to see how that the Lord will perfect that which concerns us, a theme that carries over then to our sermon text in Philippians 1. So let's read this little psalm first. Psalm 138. Notice especially the last verse of the psalm. Psalm 138, a psalm of David. I will, and we're just going to be pick up at verse 4. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. Yes, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Now, if you would turn over to Philippians 1, where we find our sermon text, you'll see that same theme at the end of Psalm 138, here also in Philippians 1. Our text is verses 3 through 8. We'll read verses 2 through 11 for context. Philippians 1, beginning at verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, just as it is right for me to think this of you all. Because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruit of righteousness, the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. That's God's word for God's people. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is New Year's Day as you are well aware of. And it is our nature as human beings to look back, perhaps with fondness, perhaps with sadness, perhaps with a little bit of both, to the year that has just passed by, and also to look forward with some anticipation, perhaps with joy about some approaching event, but also with perhaps some fear and trepidation about what is to come. Here in this passage of scripture the apostle speaks to us as he always does as an ambassador of our Lord Jesus Christ and you know what it is to be an ambassador you've seen perhaps ambassadors uh, to the United Nations or perhaps to other countries and from time to time we see them on the television we hear them standing there in some foreign country on foreign soil but as spokesman, especially of the President of the United States, in a sense speaking for the whole country, but certainly for the President, speaking to an ally. And as that ambassador speaks there, it is as if the President himself was there to speak in the interests of the United States of America. 
The ambassador expresses perhaps to an ally, especially a close ally, on some special occasion, his loving concerns and desires for that mutual fellowship and camaraderie. More so, our Lord Jesus Christ has given to his ambassadors the ability to, to speak for him in his inspired, inerrant, infallible word. And so when we come to a passage of scripture where we have a beginning of a new book where Paul speaks as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, he through that ambassador, Christ through that ambassador has more than just the ability to communicate his wishes. He has the power through his ambassadors to change those who receive the messages of his ambassadors and to produce in the hearers, the recipients of the ambassador's message, the graces that are evident in them. And so with that in mind, we come to this passage of Scripture, verses uh, 3 through 8 of first, uh, Philippians 1, where the theme set before us is thanksgiving, the apostles, the ambassadors, thanksgiving for Christ's work in you. And as we think about that as in terms of the introduction I just gave, looking back, giving thanks for what the grace that Christ has been working in us these past 12 months, looking forward to the grace that Christ will continue to work in us in the 12 months ahead. Thanksgiving for Christ's work in you, and I hope you were able to receive an outline with your bulletin. There are four points here under this theme of thanksgiving for Christ's work in you. One, His work of gospel fellowship. Two, His work in you until completed. Three, His work making you partakers of grace. And fourthly, His work of affection for each other. Let's look at those one at a time as we unpack this passage, 3 through 8. The theme again is thanksgiving for Christ's work in you in this new year. First, his work of gospel fellowship. He writes in verse, the apostle writes in verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Paul, now speaking again as an ambassador of our Lord Jesus Christ, brings us this good news of the gospel. That by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, He has, and His atoning death, He has, Christian, purchased and redeemed you, body and soul, so that you are not your own, but you belong to your faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. The cross and the empty tomb signify to that that to us once again this year, so that you, His people, beloved, though certainly you sin, as we have been reminded in our reading of the law of God, it is as if Christ is speaking to you directly here in verse 3, saying, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you all. Christ thanks the Heavenly Father for us all, remembering us every day as our great and faithful high priest and intercessor. And that spills over, that work of His grace, that gospel fellowship that we have with Him, then that vertical fellowship, if you will, that we have with Christ, then carries, out, carries over into our relationship with one another as the people of God. The result of this gospel fellowship that we have with Christ is gospel fellowship with one another. One result of it. This is part of that work of His sanctifying grace in us. That more and more, He is creating in us a thankfulness for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And as we come to the table of the Lord to, today, we call it, what do we call it besides the Lord's Supper? We sometimes refer to it as communion, don't we? And we think of this communion, it certainly points us primarily to this vertical communion that we have with God the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. But our, our 
directories of worship, both in your denomination and mine, remind us that it also speaks of that communion that we have through Christ with one another as Christians in and through Him. So the Apostle is getting at that, that gospel fellowship here. In verse 4, he says that always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy. Once again, as an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, this good news is, is here as if Jesus himself was saying to you, in every prayer of mine, as your high priest, as your mediator, as your intercessor, I am making request for you all with joy. There on the heavenly throne, as I am seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, interceding for you every day, making request for you all with joy, the text says. That's the vertical aspect of this gospel fellowship fleshed out in verse 4. Then there's the horizontal again, the, this communion of saints that flows from that vertical fellowship with God. God, the triune God. We give thanks to God because Christ is working this sanctifying grace in every one of His people. Gospel fellowship in you. Joyful, which shows itself, demonstrates itself in joyful, frequent prayer for every member of your local congregation. Which demonstrates itself as you bring your requests to the throne of grace. Your petitions for one another throughout the year. More and more, God is working this grace of gospel fellowship that is evidenced in your prayer life year after year. Verse 5 says that He rejoices in this fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Christ is the source of the fellowship that we have with one another. Our fellowship is not in some common ancestry or some common political views or in some uh, other uh, arena of commonality that we may have. Our fellowship is in the gospel, verse 5. It is in the good news of salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. On the cross, Christ destroyed the enemy that kept you apart from God the Father. In the, His resurrection, He conquered death and made peace with God so that you and I, who were once enemies, can now have fellowship with God the Father. And there He sits again on His heavenly throne as if He were, as Job says in his poetic language, laying hold of you and laying hold of the Father and bringing the two together so that you might have that gospel fellowship. Fellowship with the Father. Fellowship with the Son. Fellowship with the Holy Spirit. What a fellowship. What a joy divine we sing sometime. And so, and the, as we come to the Lord's Supper this day, at the beginning of this new year, we are once again reminded that we are to be thankful to God for that vertical fellowship that we have with Him, all three persons of the Godhead, in the Gospel. And this again results in communion of the saints on another level. That we have, notice the language of verse 5, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Not only is there a, a timeline to this fellowship from the beginning of your regeneration all the way through to your glorification, as we'll see in a moment. But in terms of space too, there is a fellowship that you have that goes far beyond these walls as you well know, that you have fellowship in the gospel with Christians all over this planet. You even have fellowship with, in a sense, with those who have gone before you all the way back until Adam in the sense that one day the church triumphant and the church militant will be one. And that fellowship will be visible instead of invisible. You know how it is. Perhaps you've experienced, some of you have traveled perhaps outside your state or even more pointedly outside this country. And perhaps you've had the wonderful experience of meeting brothers and sisters in the faith 
in other parts of this country or in other parts of the world and you've you've experienced that instant camaraderie that instant brotherhood that instant sisterhood that you recognize because this one is my brother or sister in Christ that's that gospel fellowship that goes across this world it's part of that sanctifying work of God's grace making that fellowship to us more wonderful year by year it is a fellowship from beginning to end this text says from the first day until now fellowship in the gospel is something that we want to be thankful for as we begin this new year thanking God this week this year for for that vertical fellowship first of all that's evidenced here in the Lord's Supper and then that horizontal fellowship that we have with one another in the gospel such as we read of in Psalm 133 how beautiful the sight a brethren who agree in friendship to unite and bonds of charity and so as we begin this new year beloved let us pray that Christ may give you the grace to more and more value and treasure this fellowship that you have with him and with one another because he does and so as we come to the Lord's Supper we give thanks for Christ's work in you first his work of gospel fellowship that's the first thing we give thanks for Christ's work in you secondly his work in you until completed as I mentioned there is a timeline here set before us in this passage verse 6 the Apostle goes on to say being confident in this very thing that who he who begun a good work in you will complete it and so on focus on self destroys confidence in Christ but focus on Christ builds and strengthens our confidence our faith the Arminian Christian is often filled with skepticism and doubt but we as those whom God has revealed his great power especially the doctrine of the perseverance of the Saints need not be troubled by doubts about our relationship with Christ this is that the language of verse 6 is fleshing out for us that P in the word in the acronym TULIP the perseverance of the Saints a book was written that you may be familiar with about this called the poor doubting Christian drawn to Christ confidence we, we the apostle here as an ambassador of Christ exudes confidence about the perseverance of the Saints not only his own personal perseverance but he's confident that the Philippians and as part for the whole that the whole body of Christ will persevere to the end because the Trinity guarantees the promises that are made in the scriptures so that we can have confidence in the promises made to us in Christ and this is one of those wonderful promises and if you haven't memorized it yet I would encourage you what a great thing to do at the beginning of this year to memorize verse 6 being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ perhaps you come to the end of 2016 in the beginning of a new year and you're saying uh, I'm disgusted with myself or disappointed in myself that I did not go further in terms of my sanctification in terms of my getting closer to the Lord and his people in terms of to put it in the words of Jesus loving God with all my heart soul mind and strength loving my neighbor as myself but brothers and sisters think of the words of this verse verse 6 he has begun a good work in you and he will complete it the Lord's Supper testifies to us of that beginning of this work in us by his grace that work of grace that work of justification whereby through the atonement the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ as the perfect sacrifice of ours for our sins 
We are counted as righteous in the sight of God. Justice has been satisfied in the suffering of our Savior. That's the beginning of the work of the Trinity. He's begun a good work in you. For some of you, that may have been decades ago. For others of you, it may have been just a short time ago. That was the beginning of the work of the Trinity. Justification, redemption, calling, adoption, and other, and other acts of God's grace. But that's only the, part, the beginning of the story in verse 6. Yes, he has begun a good work in you. But also, he will complete it. That's the promise that we want to hang on to in 2017 and every year. Sanctification. This is speaking now of sanctification. He will complete it. This sanctification, you might say, is the middle. The beginning is our justification. The middle is our lifelong sanctification. And the end is our glorification. And here we are in the middle. Only God knows how long that process will last. We know it will last until we, He calls us to our final state of glory. Calvin says that we Christians may encourage and confirm hope as to the time to come. And always ponder in their mind this syllogism. God does not forsake the work which His own hands have begun, as the prophet bears witness. We are the work of His hands, and therefore He will complete what He has begun in us. As Isaiah says, But now, O Lord, You are our Father. We are the clay. You and You are potter, and we all are the work of Your hand. Poor doubting Christian dawn, drawn to Christ. Do you and I have the strength in and of ourselves to do mighty, mightily, to do great things in 2017? We do not. But he who has begun in good work in you will complete it. When? For how long? Not until the day of your death. That is a wonderful thing in itself to contemplate that as God takes you, the clay, and molds you for decades, that He will continue to do so all the way until the day of your death. But that's not what the passage says, is it? Not an, it does not say, He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of your demise. What does the text say? Until the day of Jesus Christ. That is a phrase that takes our minds to the second coming. We've just celebrated the first advent of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But there is a second advent on the horizon. Only God knows when. Perhaps some of you will live to see it. The day of Jesus Christ is coming when he, the trumpet will sound and the dead will, shall be raised. And we shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. When He shall descend from heaven to take us to Himself. That's, that day of Jesus Christ is a day of glorification. The beginning is our justification. The middle is our sanctification. The end is our glorification, brothers and sisters in Christ. The end, the goal, the finish line, the completion, to use the language of the text. The completion of the work of grace comes when Christ returns. And this is promised in both Testaments, isn't it? We read already from Psalm 138. This, that is, this, this God working with the work of His hands, the potter molding the clay until the, until the end, until that state of glory. We read it in Psalm 138. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Matthew Henry commenting on this verse says, We may be confident or well persuaded that God not only will not forsake, but that He will finish and crown the work of His own hands. For as for God, His work is perfect. And so we come to the table of the Lord again today with thanksgiving in our hearts that the work that He has begun in us, fellow Christians, he will continue 
throughout our lifetime, and he will complete it in the day of Jesus Christ. That's the second thing. As we give thanks for Christ's work in you, it's his work of gospel fellowship. It's his work in you until that work is completed. And thirdly, it is his work making you partakers of his grace. Verse 7. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, you all are partakers with me of grace. Well, someone might object and say, this, isn't this too much flattery from the Apostle? Isn't this kind of language likely to give us a big head, to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think? And the Apostle here is making me a little uncomfortable. He's wearing his heart on his sleeve, as it were. Isn't this beneath this kind of language, beneath his dignity as an Apostle? But again, remember, the Apostle speaks in his ambassador as if Christ himself were speaking these words to you. The Holy Spirit says through the Apostle, it is right to think this way about Christ's sheep. It is right to have every member of your congregation in your hearts. Why? Because you are all partakers with the Apostles of the grace of God in Christ. Because you all have, are recipients, partakers of grace. Getting what you do not deserve because of what Christ did. Grace via the cross. Grace via the empty tomb. Grace because Christ rules and reigns on His throne and is your high priest and intercessor. intercessor. Grace all the way through until the day of Jesus Christ. As if Christ is speaking to all of you Himself saying, I have you all in my heart. What precious words are those from the lips of our Savior to all His sheep. I have you all in my heart. As if He had said to you, individually and as a group, you are all, brothers and sisters, partakers of my grace. And this grace becomes evident over the years. It becomes evident in particular, the text focuses on one aspect of that brings, fleshes out this and ex manifests this grace in us, namely persecution. Verse 7 says, Inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. You may or may not remember that this is one of the prison epistles. That is to say that Paul the Apostle is in prison when he's penning, writing this letter. He is suffering. He is literally in chains for the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. It may be that in, our, in your lifetime, young people especially, things are changing in our state and in our country. Christian liberty, the liberty of freedom of religion as it's expressed in our Constitution is certainly under attack, under attack by many in our country. It may be that one day we will perhaps not be in chains, but at least be persecuted for the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here the word defense and confirmation remind us of watching a sporting event. Super Bowl's coming up sometime soon. I'm not a fan so I couldn't tell you the date, but it's coming up. And in that contest on the gridiron, there will be those who are defending and there will be those who are taking on the offense, pushing forward, and others who are pushing back. That's the idea here in this language. In my chains, in chains I, have in, I am in these chains, says the Apostle, because of my defense and because of my confirmation of the gospel. Christ displays His grace in us when we, must, we are called upon, or He calls upon us to defend the gospel. 
And we may, in fact, have to do that more in 2017 than we did in 2016. Only God knows. He also displays His grace in you, His people, when you are called upon to promote and to explain the gospel. We are now again here in this passage reminded that we are not an island of believers here in this little congregation. It's as if we zoom out and see the worldwide church, all of us partakers of grace, many of our brothers and sisters right now literally being imprisoned in chains. That we are one with those. We, here's that gospel fellowship again. We are one with those who are defending the faith weekly. We are one with those who are promoting and spreading the gospel week after week. And so the Lord's Supper, as we come to this table again this morning, and we give thanks for Christ's work in you, we thank God that He has made us partakers of His grace. That's the third thing. The last thing that we are giving thanks to God for, the thanksgiving for Christ's work in you, His work of affection for each other. And this perhaps strikes you in an unusual way. The others uh, we are quite familiar with, I think, so, I think, gospel fellowship. The fact that that work of sanctifying grace will carry on until all the way through our glorification. The, the, the elementary fact that we are partakers of His grace. But this is maybe something we don't think often enough about. That part of the work of grace is His work of built, promoting in us and growing in us affection for one another. Verse 8, the Apostle writes, For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. This is a rare oath from the pen and the lips of the Apostle. It's not often that he says, for God is my witness. He drives the point home with this oath. That Christ's affectionate longing for all his sheep is a gospel reality. Jesus uh, speaks that in his high priestly prayer. You can hear that affection that he has for all of his sheep. Including you and I, brothers and sisters. In his prayer, for example, in John 17, 13, where he says, Now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Hear his affection for you. He prays in verse 15, I pray that you not should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Hear his affection for you. That you, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Verse 19, for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified in the truth. These are expressions of love and affection from the lips of our Savior in behalf of His people. And then, of course, this week after week, this is God's desire for you. That you may be thankful for His work of growing that affection for one another in your hearts and in your minds, week after week in this progressive sanctification. Christ working this grace in you too. The affection of our Lord Jesus Christ for us produces this longing. Look down in chapter 2, verse 4 here of Philippians. As you turn the page or scroll down to chapter 2, verse 4, we have this affection of Jesus Christ laid out for us in these beautiful words. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, and so on. Christ, in 2017 again, will slowly be working and producing in you a growing Christ-like affection for all the members of your congregation. After all, the fruit of the Spirit is, what's the first thing? Love and joy, peace, long-suffering, so on. And love, we are told in 1 Corinthians 13, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, 
thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. And say so more and more in 2017, beloved, may Christ give you the grace to say with sincerity like the apostle, God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. As we come to the table of the Lord, we are reminded that sometimes that fellowship is most evident and blessed when we sit around a table together. Not, not only the Lord's table, but also the, the fellowship meal and other occasions when we have time to sit at table with one another, bear one another's burdens and talk to each other about how we can pray for each other and so on. And this Lord's Supper points forward as well. There's an already aspect about this Lord's Supper, about this vertical communion we have with Christ and the horizontal communion we have with one another. But there's a future aspect of it in the terms of the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's a precursor or a a shadow that points to something much more glorious. In Revelation 19 we read these words. The multitude says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and His wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And He said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And He said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And so as we come now to the table of the Lord, we come with thanksgiving for Christ's work in you, beloved. His work of gospel fellowship. His work in you until the day of Jesus Christ. His work making you partakers of grace. His work in growing that affection for one another in you to be more Christ-like. Amen.